promoting understanding between faiths in one of the world's most religiously contentious regions. Pope Francis visits the Middle East, insisting his trip is absolutely not political. But can the Pope be a friend to all and encourage friendship among enemies? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. His first trip abroad as Pope was to Brazil, embraced as something of a native son by the world's largest Catholic country. His second is proving more contentious. Pope Francis is on a three-day tour of the Middle East, a region where his flock has been slowly diminishing and where religious and political tensions are rife. The Vatican says the visit is a commemorative one. To mark the 50th anniversary of the meeting in Jerusalem between Pope Paul VI and the spiritual leader of the world's Orthodox Christians, Patriarch Athenogaras. But can the trip serve a greater purpose? Atia Abawi is following events from Bethlehem in the occupied West Bank. Pope Francis started his second day in the Holy Land in Bethlehem. He was choppered in by Jordanian helicopters to a crowd of cheering thousands in Manger Square. His first stop was to meet with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. From there, he got into the Pope Mobile to make his way to Manger Square, but he made an unexpected stop at the separation wall, where he got out of his vehicle, went up to the wall, and prayed for five minutes under a graffiti sign that read, Pope, we need someone to speak about justice. And although the Pope has emphasized that his trip to the Holy Land is primarily as a Christian pilgrim, this act spoke louder than any words. He then made it back to Manger Square where he held a two-hour mass. After the mass, he had lunch with five Palestinian families before heading to a refugee camp to meet with the children there. Tonight, he'll be heading off to Jerusalem where he will meet with the leader of the Eastern Orthodox Church, Bartholomew I, in a sign of Christian unity. He will then have dinner at the Latin Patriarchate before calling it a night. Atia Bowie for Inside Story in Bethlehem. And in what the Vatican is describing as an unprecedented papal initiative, Pope Francis has invited the Israeli and Palestinian presidents to come to the Vatican to discuss peace efforts. The time has come for everyone to find the courage to be generous and creative in the service of the common good, the courage to forge a peace which rests on the acknowledgement by all of the right of two states to exist and to live in peace and security within internationally recognized borders. So what is the Pope hoping to achieve from his trip? Let's bring in our guests. In Jerusalem, Yehudu Hakohen, a rabbi and peace activist. Joining us from Rome is Massimo Franco, a political columnist for Corriere della Sera and author of the book, Once There Was a Vatican. Also in Jerusalem is Wadi Abu Nasser, media advisor to the Catholic Church in Jerusalem. Welcome to you all. Let's begin with Wadi Abu Nasser. Within a few hours of arriving in the Holy Land, the Pope formally invites Israeli and Palestinian presidents to come and pray in the Vatican. Was that a surprise to you? Well, uh, the Pope is known to be the man of surprises, especially positive surprises. And uh, he surprised us today by stopping in front of the wall, which symbols uh, separation and uh, sending a clear message of hope uh, against uh, this uh, wall, and also a call for a peace uh, prayer in Rome. And I am very happy that the two leaders of Israel and Palestine uh, responded positively to this invitation. Well, Rabbi Yehuda Hakohen, uh, did it come as a surprise to you, the Pope being a man of surprises, as we heard there? No, not at all. I think that the people of Jerusalem uh, are primarily concerned with the Pope's ambitions for the tomb of King David on Mount Zion. And uh, according to several reports, including reports released from uh, the Vatican itself and also from uh, the Franciscan custody here in Jerusalem, uh, the Israeli government is under tremendous pressure from the Vatican to hand over sovereignty 
of the shrine, the Crusader shrine, on top of the tomb of David. Well, that and is there an many issue in that Jerusalem who fear that. Well, uh, sorry, Rabbi, that is an issue that that we will return to a little bit uh, later in this uh, show. Mm -hmm. But let, let me just go to Massimo Franco in Rome on the issue of the invitation. Uh, was that expected within Vatican circles that there would be an invitation to Palestinian and Israeli leaders so quickly into the trip? Well, I think it's a pretty unexpected move, uh, but it's, it can be explained. The problem is that the Vatican today in the Middle East is very weak. And I think that there is a very great concern of a balkanization of the area, which means the fragmentation of the present nations in one religion, one party nations, with the possibility of continuous war, which would squeeze and progressively destroy the presence of Christian minorities. Posing the Vatican as a mediator between the two parts, between the Palestinians and the Israelis, I think the Pope is trying to, get, to give the Vatican a central role on the international stage. So there is, I would say, a geo-religious reason behind this initiative. Well, uh, Yehuda Hako, and to, to, to go back to you, uh, is this possibly the beginning of the uh, another uh, first salvo in a Vatican-led peace initiative? Is there uh, any thought that this might be the case? Well, the Vatican has wanted uh, a foothold in the region for a long time. Since at least 1947, the Vatican has wanted the internationalization of Jerusalem, which would ultimately give the Vatican some form of political sovereignty over the city. Uh, quite frankly, my position is that the Western world, and I would include the Vatican in that obviously, has created enough a strife here in our region for Jews and for Palestinians and for the broader Middle East, that we, the peoples of the Middle East, really need to be able to come together without uh, people like the Pope or John Kerry or Catherine Ashton or Tony Blair. And we, the peoples of the Middle East, need to formulate together a way forward without outside interference and, of course, outside interference that might be motivated by ulterior motives. Well, Wadi Abu Nasser, uh, the contention that there is a possible ulterior motive in this regarding Vatican control or increasing Vatican control, uh, wh what's your reaction to that? Well, I don't know from where these stories are uh, fabricated. What is sure is that, uh, the, first of all, the Vatican and the Universal Catholic Church is part of better future, not of a kind of conflict. Furthermore, Christians of the Middle East are indigenous and an integral part of the region. They are not uh, uh, crusaders and they are not uh, foreigners. They are integral part aside their brothers, Muslims and Jews. And I don't believe that uh, any reconciliation process could work without uh, local Christians and without the support of the Universal Church. The Vatican is not looking for any sovereignty in Jerusalem. On the contrary, the Vatican is quite in encouraging a peaceful reconciliation. But the fact that the church is asking for its basic rights to pray uh, in a very holy shrine where we do believe Jesus had the Last Supper, it is, I believe, it is a basic right and it is not a favor that we are asking from anybody. Well, that is a point, as I mentioned, that we will return to a little bit later. But Massimo Franco, um, this the second uh, visit, trip of the Pope, and already there appears to be the signs that this is very much an activist Pope. This is one who's going to go out. He is not going to avoid trouble spots. The very choice of the Holy Land of the Middle East as uh, his destination for his second trip is significant, is it not? Is this not sending a signal? Well, I think that uh, this is the signal of a pope which doesn't reflect anymore the divisions between East and West. This pope is not perceived as his predecessors, mistakenly or not, as a sort of religious projection of the West and of the Atlantic Alliance because he's a Latin American. So I think that, of course, he enters a situation which is very much compromised and complicated. But I think that the signal he's trying to give is to his communities, you have to move on, 
and also to the Palestinians and the Israelis. If the West so far failed to make you reach an agreement, we might try to do that from the religious point of view, which is the key question and the focus in the Middle East. Well, as we mentioned, the Pope is saying that this trip is totally non-political. Even so, he's treading a delicate uh, diplomatic path on this visit. He was welcomed to Bethlehem by Mahmoud Abbas, whom the Vatican recognizes as a president of a legitimate state of Palestine. There, the Pope stopped to pray at the separation wall that carves up much of the occupied West Bank. His schedule takes him to the old city of Jerusalem and the site of what Jews call the Temple Mount and Muslims call Haram al-Sharif, an area at the very heart of who should be in control of Jerusalem. And a meeting with Israeli Minister, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is being carefully arranged to avoid controversy from the Vatican's point of view, taking place at the Notre Dame Center, which is a Vatican sovereign uh, territory. Uh, Rabbi Hakohen, to return to the point that you um, made right at the beginning, the Pope will also be holding prayers in uh, the David's tomb compound in the Holy City. This is regarded as something deeply controversial by Israelis, is it not? It is. In fact, uh, the government of Israel has made sure to arrest nearly 30 activists this morning and uh, have issued restraining orders to over a dozen people in order not to disturb the Pope's visit, uh, essentially to keep all controversy away. From, uh, from the Pope's visit. Now this Pope, Pope Francis, is the first Jesuit Pope in a very long time, uh, which means he has a missionary agenda, and in fact, every time he's had the opportunity, he's called on the Catholic Church to take a more aggressive role in spreading the gospel. Now the Jewish people, the children of Israel, and the other peoples of the Middle East aren't interested in a modern day crusade in our region, and any interference, whether political or otherwise, in our region will not be welcomed by the peoples of the Middle East. Well, Massimo Franco, there you heard mention of the fact that this is a Jesuit pope. Uh, does that, the fact, his background, that he comes from what is seen as a, a particularly strong and muscular uh, portion of the Catholic Church, um, is that part of what is driving him on this uh, trip, do you think? Well, I think that the fact that he's a Jesuit doesn't matter so much. The church ch has chosen a Jesuit pope just because there had been the resignation of Benedict XVI. After the resignation of a pope, everything of the past was lowered down. So the fact that he's a Jesuit doesn't matter so much. What matters a lot is that this pope doesn't want to be identified as in the past with the West, with the United States. So what matters is the attempt to change the paradigms, maybe also of the deal between the Palestinians and the Israelis. So what we see in a new view is the fact that the Vatican is changing its approach, but of course very cautiously, because they know that the path is very complicated and there are many nerves which are touched by this visit. Well, Wadi Abu Nasser, we hear very cautiously that phrase, yet once again, to return to the issue of um, uh, the David's tomb compound where the Pope will be um, saying prayers. And, and for our viewers, just to make clear, he will be in what is the site or believed to be the site of the Last Supper, uh, which is in part of a compound which is controlled at the stage by a, uh, a Jewish religious um, uh, seminary uh, in, in, in that particular region. Was it a conscious decision to go to David's tomb? Well, first of all, we are not going to David's tomb. We are going to the Last Supper room, to the cenacle, where Jesus had his Last Supper according to our tradition. And I don't think that this is a, a, a part of David's tomb. Furthermore, I, I know that the Franciscan friars bought the place several centuries ago and the place was confiscated from them. The fact that it was confiscated, it doesn't mean that it is now and it should be the property of the confiscator uh, or the successor of the confiscator. Now, above all, what we are saying, people are more important than stones. 
I believe that there is a space for better understanding, better respect towards Christians and their rights to, play, to pray in their uh, holy shrines. And the Last Supper room is one of our most important shrines in the holy city of Jerusalem. Well, Rabbi Yehuda, uh, your response to that, and, and clarifying once again for our viewers that the room in which the uh, Last Supper is believed to have been held is actually on the floor above David's tomb. It is the same building. Not only is it on the floor above David's tomb, it was built by crusaders, so I don't know how it could have possibly been the room of the Last Supper. But for Jews, there's a very sensitive issue here, that according to our culture, and according to our way of life going back thousands of years, uh, Catholicism, unlike Islam, is viewed as idolatry. And if the building uh, where David is buried is turned into a, a church, have regular prayer services uh, by an idolatrous faith, that would actually mean that the natives of Jerusalem would not be allowed to go in and visit the tomb of David. There would be a prohibition according to our civilization, according to our culture, that we're not allowed into the building. Well, Massimo Franco, so it's an this, extremely sensitive issue. This, the, the, this discussion that we're hearing at the moment is a very good example of how contentious every single move can be in this deeply uh, disputed and contentious region. But is this something that the Vatican thought through? We've just heard how deeply argumentative uh, choosing such a site for prayer will be. Is this, you said cautious, is the Vatican being cautious? Yes, it is cautious. You know, the problem is quite simple. This is a war of religion going on for dozens of years. And what we see now is the fact that we perceive quite neatly that Christian minorities, who were a sort of bridge between the West and the Arab world, and which were a bridge between different faiths today are very much weakened. And the outcome has been that tensions have grown up, the situation has grown more and more complicated, and so there is a bad need for an initiative. But I also think that the Vatican knows that it is considered and viewed as a part of this war. So it's very difficult to gain an active role after all these years, because so many international powers are playing their role. And the Vatican, at the moment, has a new pope, which is an objective strength. But there is a tradition of tensions and misunderstandings with the Israelis of role, which might prove to be an obstacle. Well, Wadi Abu Nasser, um, that we've heard reference to what some would view as the marginalization of Christians within the region in terms of the influence that they wield with regard to ongoing negotiations or, as we have at present, lack of any form of negotiation. Are you hoping that the Pope can spark off some kind of revival to create a wider base for discussion within the region that is not restricted uh, to Jews and Muslims? Well, I believe that the Middle East conflict is multidimensional conflict, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it depends how you look at it. I believe it's mainly unfortunate that a uh, religion plays a role. And I believe that the Holy Father, being uh, uh, the most prominent leader in the Christian world, has a role to play at least morally. And I believe also in prayers, as we believe that uh, the Holy Father's prayer for Syria succeeded uh, to stop the war on Syria last year. I do hope that uh, the Pope's call for a prayer for Middle East peace process would push forward uh, peace talks between Israelis and Palestinians. Above all, I do believe that Christians could be become a real bridge between our brothers, Muslims and Jews, especially indigenous local Christians of the Middle East, because I believe Christian presence in the Middle East is not only a Christian interest, but it is also a Muslim and Jewish interest as well. Well, uh, Rabbi Yehuda, your, your view of that, do you think that uh, Christians could play a greater role in terms of creating uh, not only interfaith dialogue, but also in, as a bridge uh, to the parties that remain in dispute? 
And no, I don't, because I think there's a lot more similarities between Jewish civilization, Hebrew civilization, and Islamic civilization than there is between either of our civilizations with the Christian world. There's the Jewish people and the other peoples of the Middle East, specifically those who ascribe to Islam, need to come together and maybe collectively formulate our position on how we relate to the Christian. Well, that peace will begin when the Jews and the Muslims come together first. Well, let's just pause there and, and look at another issue in the wider region, and that is the, the dwindling of the Christian faithful. The Pope's visit comes at a time when the number of the Christians in the region is on the decline. In the Holy Land, Christians now make up just 2% of the population, compared to 10% when the State of Israel was established in 1948. In Bethlehem, numbers have dropped to less than a third, compared to 75% a few decades ago. And the trend can be seen across the Middle East. In Egypt, the number of Christians is down by 9% since 1900. That figure is 11% in Syria. And in Lebanon, the number of Christians has decreased by 43%. It means that over the past century, the region's Christian population has halved from 10 to 5%. Massimo Franco, uh, this is something obviously of, of great concern to the Vatican at a particular time. Is this something that also propelled this visit to the knowledge that the number of Christians is dwindling in the region? Well, I think that uh, there, is, there has been a steady decline and that there had been an acceleration after the Iraq war and the so said Arab Springs. I think that at this point, this decline might be irreversible. But that doesn't mean that the Pope is trying hard to revive this presence because he's very concerned of the consequences it might provoke. I think that what we are viewing now is a challenge of soft power, which means the Vatican, against hard power, which means the military solution tempted in the past and which failed. So what we are seeing now is the attempt to propose again the strength of soft power because this is the only way for Christian minorities to regain momentum and to stop the, a sort of damnation to flee all these countries. So it's, it's a very desperate challenge at the moment. Well, Wadi Abu Nasser, your, your view on that, the projection of soft power in a bid uh, to create a greater space for Christians, not only uh, where you are, but in the, in, the, in the wider Middle East region as well. Well, I believe that there are different issues that one should talk about, but really to be brief, first of all, uh, we have to talk that uh, it is not only that Christians are dwindling, it is mainly others who are uh, growing. Secondly, uh, unfortunately, the regional instability uh, throughout the Middle East contributed significantly to the, uh, uh, to the departure of Christians. And uh, third, uh, we have a kind of modernization process amongst Christians in the Middle East, which brought down the fertility rate. But I do believe above all, regardless to the figures, I believe that Christians are called, as, Christ, as Jesus says, to be the salt. The salt doesn't mean to be the majority. I believe that a Christian should remain a qualitative player in the Middle East in the sense of promoting better understanding being uh, on, the other, on the one hand, being uh, uh, Palestinians and Arabs, so they have good uh, relations with Muslims, and also especially Christians in Israel, and with a, a long heritage of understanding Jews. I believe that, again, Christians in general, Christians in the Middle East, could really be become a good player uh, in, the, in the Middle East, regardless to their uh, uh, re uh, numbers and figures. Well, at that particular point, my thanks to our guests, Rabbi Yehuda Hakohen, Massimo Franco, and Wadi Abu Nasser. And do please let us know your thoughts. You can join this discussion online at facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story, or go to at AJ Inside Story on Twitter. I'm Mike Hanna. Thanks for watching. From me and all the team, goodbye for now.